access to some of the links that I have, um, including the slides and exercises and whatnot. So I am really excited to be leading my very first workshop with Our Ladies DC and also kind of nervous. So hopefully this goes okay. And I'm really excited to talk about my favorite thing ever, which is reporting with Cordo and specifically parameterized reporting where we can create all these different variations of reports from one single template. So of course, thank you to our ladies, Washington DC for inviting me to speak. Um, and also to Crystal, Shannon and Peter and Mina and Andrew who have these amazing workshop websites that I like very deeply repo dived and sort of structured this workshop um, from their amazing workshops. So this is all, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. So a uh, big shout out to, you know, the art community. So the basically anything that comes out of my mouth tonight is on my own accord and does not express the views of my employer or any organizations I'm associated with. All the work is licensed under the CC by a no commercial, non-share alike license. That's the boring stuff. So um, a little bit of background on myself is I work for the Washington State Department of Agriculture as a data scientist, and I specifically work in the natural resources and agricultural sciences section, where I do a lot of soil health, um, data management, data collection. Um, so there's some pictures of me in the field collecting soil samples. And then my cats are my muses for everything. So it I have Ty, Mai, and Sky, my three snowshoe cats. And I uh, recently started a, a small business called The Coding Cats, where I have an Etsy store um, where I kind of make designs that combine my love of cats and our code. So um, some quick logistics. Uh, I recommend logging into the posit cloud link because I have all the files and packages and stuff set up so that way there's no version issues and we sort of know right off the bat that things will run um, but if posit cloud doesn't work um, you can download these materials locally um, use this has a really good function where you can just run this and then um, it will download all the materials to your uh, machine wherever you uh, set your directory to. Um, and if you haven't used Zoom before, I'd really like this to be interactive and engaging. So please feel free to ask questions in the public Zoom chat, raise your hand. Um, the bottom bar has reactions where you can also just tell me how you're feeling. Uh, and the general workshop structure here is going to be kind of a mixture of presentation, exercises where you'll get to go either on your own machine or in the Plaza Cloud instance and try these things out yourself. Um, and then I'll demo the exercises. Um, and then at the end of each exercise, as sort of a check in to let me know that you're done, um, there'll be some little questions to answer. And then uh, there are a couple demos where you'll just kind of watch as I walk through and explain things. So this is what the exercise screen looks like. So I'd like everyone to just try raising and lowering your hand on Zoom using your favorite reaction and in the chat share your name, where you're calling in from if you haven't already done that, um, or one thing that you've made, whether that's with R, Cordo, whatever, that you're proud of. And I'll set the timer. Also, I'm just so excited to see so many folks here from all around the world. That's really cool. And I will try to do my best to answer questions um, in the chat or raised hands and uh, well, with help from the organizers if I do miss something. Also, it's really cool to see so many of my friends on here. So 
some super cool projects. Cool. Okay. So some, we've got four learning objectives today. First is to understand what parameterized reporting is, when it's useful, like what kinds of projects it's useful for. Uh, then learning how to convert an existing report into a parameterized template that we can use to render a bunch of variations of the same report. And then render every variation of that report at one time using the Cordo R package and the PER package. And then generate multiple format outputs from that same template file using conditional content and conditional code execution to control um, whether it's visible or hidden or whether it's even executed. Okay, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page with um, the code syntax that I'm using and the RStudio setup, um, a little aside here. So a lot of you are probably familiar with the Migrator pipe in 2021. Um, native R pipe was released in RStudio. Um, I personally just switched over to the native R pipe um, without any issues, but I know there are some things that don't run quite the same way. So Isabella has a really good blog post for understanding the native R pipe, but basically you can read the pipe as and then do something. So for example, if we had a function called do something, um, we would have, you know, the regular arguments, but instead we could do um, argument one, which is usually you're going to be your data frame and then and then do something with these other arguments. And then uh, for like a real example, if we have a mean, if we, if we have a vector from zero to 10, we can calculate the mean of it or with the pipe, it would be the vector of zero to 10 and then compute the mean on it. So just in case that's an unfamiliar syntax for you, I just wanted to quickly point that out. Um, if you do want to switch over to um, the native pipe operator, it's a setting in tools, global options, code editing, and then it's a checkbox. And the shortcut is control shift M. JD, I can then... see a hand. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Paula, All right. did you uh, have a question or did you just not? Unraise your hand. I did not unraise my hand. Okay. <laughs> I'm happy to see you here. Uh, Paula is one of my colleagues in Washington State. Okay, so namespacing. Um, if you haven't seen this before, it's where we have the package and then a double colon and then our function. And uh, this is so that R knows explicitly which function or which package a function is being used from. So for example, dplyr and uh, mass are both packages that have a function called select. So if we do the double colon namespacing, then that means that R knows that we're using uh, like dplyr, for example. And then um, if you're using namespacing, you don't need to uh, use the library call. So in general for um, these workshop materials, I'm using the namespacing double colon in the presentation. So that way, if you've never seen a function before, uh, it's really explicit where I'm getting that function from. Um, but the exercises and the um, QMD files that I have, in the posit cloud and that uh, zip file, um, they're gonna just use the regular like library call. And then RStudio options, um, Cordo YAML, which we'll work in a lot today. The YAML indentations are very, very fussy. So I like to turn on the indentation guides um, to rainbow lines so that I can see um, whether things are lining up correctly. And then also matching parentheses, so each set of parentheses is a different color, and divs, so the, the three colons. So just in case um, you're newer to R, R Studio, I just wanted to highlight some of these settings. Okay, so I did want to designate a portion of this to talking about R Markdown and uh, whether you should convert to Cordo, um, the sort of the differences. But first, I'd like to get a little bit of input from you all on what your comfort level and experience with R Markdown and Cordo 
is. So if you could put in the chat just a brief um, what you're using generally for your work or if you'd like to move over to Cordo, if you've already moved to Cordo and are just curious about how to do parameterized reporting, let me know. Yes, Eli, I used a lot of your uh, materials from uh, NIMS. Super exciting, there's a good mixture of our Markdown users, Cordo users. Cool. Okay, so our Markdown is an entire ecosystem built on R using the Knitter engine. And what this means for all the different outputs like websites, blogs, presentations, reports, dashboards, these all require different packages to create these things. And so there can be differences in how the package is maintained or the API is written. So there might be different um, inconsistencies with syntax and whatnot. So it's a little bit harder to maintain um, a specific project when you need all these different packages. So Cordo is sort of the next generation of R Markdown, and it's not exclusive to R. Um, instead, you can use Python, Observable, Julia, and these languages get passed to the Cordo command line interface, or CLI, and um, that creates a Markdown file, which then gets uh, transformed basically into your HTML websites, blogs, uh, reveal JS slides, or your more um, basic like reports with Word documents or PDFs. So it's a lot more expansive, but it's also, you don't need so many dependencies and packages. It's, it's batteries included, so to speak. So the way that it works is there's a Cordo file that has the extension .qmd, and then depending on the language that you're using, it'll go through either the Knitter engine or the Jupyter engine, which works for Python and Julia. And then that gets converted into a Markdown document that then goes into Pandoc, which does all of its wizardry that I don't understand and probably will never understand. And then it spits out these presentations or websites or blogs, PDFs, Word reports, and it's it's just magical. Like I, I immediately made the switch to Cordo after hearing about it from the R Studio conference in 2022. So the core differences is that R Markdown is this huge ecosystem that requires a lot of packages. It's dependent on R versus Cordo. It's a command line interface tool that uses different languages, it uses different engines, and therefore expanding the R Markdown ecosystem. But it's also batteries included, so you don't need all those different packages. It's based off of the same CLI um, and you will see later in this presentation that there's the YAML headings where you just get to pick your format um, and don't need to install a different package for that. So um, our markdown will still be maintained, but no new features according to uh, Ihue's blog post when Cordo was first announced in 2022. And one of the differences that's kind of sad for Cordo that we don't have um, is the knit with parameters GUI. Um, if you already have a parameterized report with our markdown, um, you may be familiar with the little button that says knit with parameters, and then it has this little mini shiny user interface where you can uh, use like drop downs and check boxes. There's no equivalent to that with Cordo, and according to 
some GitHub discussion. There's no plans on making that a feature. Um, the workaround is to build your own web app and basically get the parameters as an input, um, serialize it into just a string to pass to the YAML, and then that gets passed to the Cordo CLI. And the uh, GitHub discussion that I got this information from is linked here. Okay, so if you do want to convert from R Markdown to Cordo, it's surprisingly simple. Um, you just change the file extension from RMD to QMD, and the YAML header is a little different where instead of um, the output where you would have PDF, docx, et cetera, you would change that to format. And then I think there's a few other like small differences. And uh, there's a function in the knitter package where you can actually convert your chunk headers. So some of the, um, I didn't actually include a image of this, but um, instead of like having the like chunk options um, in the same little brackets, you would instead use what's called a hash pipe, which is like the pound sign in a, um, a pipe symbol. So you'll see an example of that later, but there's a function to actually convert all of those chunk headers now. So uh, if you are an R Markdown user and want to um, have more in-depth uh, instructions for how to make the switch, um, there's that workshop that I mentioned from Mina and Andrew. Um, there's the frequently asked questions on the Cordo site, and then Ted Laderas gave a a talk on what's different between our Cordo and our Markdown. Okay, so parameterized reports. There are so many cool use cases for them. Um, there's some examples with um, most of these are actually our Markdown besides the soil health one, um, because I think it is still pretty new for uh, parameterized reporting with Cordo. So there's you can use parameters for like different geographies, like in these three examples, um, you're picking like what location of the ocean floor and what different states um, for these fiscal briefs and summary statistics for driver quality. Um, and then the example that uh, I presented at Posit Conf last year was these were these soil health reports, where every single participating farmer that um, we had sampled their fields, they got their very own interactive HTML report and a PDF version of that same report so that they can understand their soil health in their fields compared to others in the same county and cropping system and across the entire project. So most of these use cases are based on creating different versions um, depending on how you want to filter your data. The other kind of use case for parameter parameterized reporting is using a different report is creating a different report for different audiences. So you could have a parameter like true or false for whether or not you want to show code for technical staff and then hide code for everybody else. And so there's this stack overflow question that uh, demonstrates how to do this. So in the chat, what kinds of reports are you looking to parameterize and what would the parameters be? Like um, location, year, anything else? Yes, all really cool use cases. Okay, so um, what are parameterized reports? Um, I like to think of them as a custom function that's really fancy. So imagine you have a function, which is basically your QMD file. And that's your template. And the input is going to be your parameters. So 
the the syntax for your parameters is this params dollar sign year and that's this params object and then it's a list so you're then calling um, each parameter in that list so in this example we're using year and then the output of this function from this template using those parameters are going to be all these different reports so for example um, we have year and we fed in a vector of uh, these five years, 2019 to 2023, um, and we would get five separate variations of that report using those different years. And what makes a report parameterized is the YAML header with the params object and in the YAML header the params is represented by these key value pairs. So a YAML is yet another markdown language or others call it YAML ain't markup language and those like two definitions kind of um, are conflicting with one another which I think is funny but anyways um, these, these params, this params object can then be used in your report to create these different variations from that template. So if what I just said kind of went over your head, we'll go more in depth and actually see how this works. Um, also, what's really important to note is that YAML, because it is a separate language, it doesn't know what data frames are or other objects in R. So the valid parameter values are going to be strings, numbers, or Boolean. And so if you did want to pass a data frame, you would need to serialize it with like JSON light and pass that as a parameter, then unserialize it back to a data frame within the Cordo con report content. So this is a little bit more advanced and we're not gonna cover it in our workshop today, but if you are interested in passing a data frame as a parameter, um, a couple of resources, uh, Christoph is one of the developers of Cordo. He gave an answer to why a data frame won't work as a parameter. And then John has a blog post on parameters in Cordo and how to use the JSON light package to uh, do that serializing and unserializing of a data frame. Okay, so the workflow that I have sort of adapted with parameterized reporting for the, the soils project um, was creating a report template that has these default values or these default parameters hard coded. And then I render the report, review it, tweak it. And once I've got kind of a standard format or a template that I like, then I will <clears throat> um, set the YAML params. Um, in, in the YAML, you have to have like default values and then you're able to like just click render and then uh, it will use those default parameters. So once we have the YAML, then the second step is to replace all of those hard-coded values within your report content with those params variables. So once those two steps are done, I will render the report, review, make more revisions, and sort of iterate over this process. And then I will change the default parameters to the extreme cases. So for example, in the soils data, um, we'd have some producers or farmers that would have one sample. And then we'd have another producer that has like 12 samples. And so I'd render the person that has one and then a report for the one that has 12. And a lot of times I'd have to make revisions because the tables would go off the page and I'd have to make some tweaks for like page breaks and that kind of thing, just to make sure that the plots and tables looked correct. So um, that's something that I sort of learned the hard way is uh, do some exploratory analysis, see what your extreme cases are, and then plug those in before you get to this next step of rendering all the variations of the report at one time. Um, it took about, I think four hours or something like that for my soils reports. And so if I had just rendered all the variations at one time, it wouldn't have gone well because I would have had to go, on, go back and uh, fix things and then re-render everything all over again. So definitely test your extreme cases. 
Okay, so this is the first exercise. And if you're in Posit Cloud uh, or you're our studio locally, um, open the example one Swiss Cats QMD. Try rendering with the render button. Take a look at the source markdown and code and the rendered report. Uh, just kind of explore it a little bit and then update your name as the author, re-render it, and then when you're done, put what variables we could set as parameters. And this is also a good time to ask questions, come off mute or put them in the chat. And um, yeah, I'll just be sitting here looking at the sea of black boxes. You don't have to turn your cameras on, it's fine, unless you want to. And somebody asked in a direct message if this will be recorded and published, and yes, it will be. And I'll also say that I'm going to do the same workshop, potentially with some improvements, um, February 21st, I think, for Our Ladies Abuja. So stay tuned for that announcement. Oh, I love the love for the shirts. I'm wearing one. Right now, too. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> it gives me confidence for this kind of thing. Would this snowshoe population final graph be an example of a hard-coded variable? Yes. The, the breed would be the, the parameter. Yep, breed and ear. Um, the parameters uh, are just, are not in, um, there are no parameters in this file yet. So the title, subtitle, author, date modified, all of those are other YAML options. Yeah, YAML fields. <laughs> yeah, Liz said um, the country could be a parameter. Um, yes, if there has if there was a column for it. So this specific data set is from Switzerland, and so the data is only Switzerland. Um, so you can take a look at the uh, the data frame in the R Studio environment and see what uh, actual columns there are um but basically anything that you could filter by uh could be a good parameter
Yes, pet type. That's also one. I know. Um, I was looking for exclusively a cat's data set, but I couldn't uh, find one that I that wasn't spatial or imagery like there's a lot of like classification public data sets to like classify this as a cat or a dog but um that's not exactly what I needed so there are dogs though it's a data set from Switzerland that has cats dogs goats cows like all livestock but the variables were different so I only used cats and dogs Okay, so let me hop over to Posit Cloud and just show. Let's see. I have to restart up the cloud. It does time out. Okay. Um, Sahana, so you are direct messaging me. Um, so I, I don't know if you want to change the message to everyone, because I'm sure if one person has a question, then there's surely others. But the question is, what's the difference between using a temporary copy in Posit Cloud versus saving a permanent copy? No need to answer right away. Just curious. My understanding is that once, if it's a temporary copy, uh, any changes that I push will go to your temporary copy versus a permanent copy, it kind of detaches itself from this project. Um, and the permanent copy will be forever in your own workspace. But this is my first time using Posit Cloud. So I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in on the chat, um, their, their understanding of that. OK, so um, yes. Libby, this is a fun example. I had to go and like create my own. Um, there's in the data folder, there's the R script where I was able to download the data and select the the variables that I wanted. There's a lot more information with this data set too, like um, the number of pets that the owner has. Uh, like, yeah, there's, check it out. It's interesting. I ended up deleting most of it though, because it got too complicated. Anyways, um, so the first step was to just render the report. I'll skip that, but basically you would just go and change the author metadata to my cat names, my Titan Sky, and then render it. And so again, we don't have any parameters here. We are, uh, our hard-coded variables are um, here, like, pet type is cat. So the two variables that we're going to parameterize are pet type and breed. Um, you could you could have used year also, but because my plot is like a time series across years, um, I ended up not parameterizing that. I was going to have a challenge at the end, but I don't think we'd have time. So if you want like an extra challenge after this workshop, um, try parameterizing the month and then year. So you would have to change the plot code also so that you're visualizing it by month per year and then setting the year as a parameter. But that's an aside. Anyways, um, so basically anytime I have like pet type or um, down here breed is what we're going to parameterize. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so setting the parameters in the YAML header. So this is just sort of all the, the metadata. Um, the YAML is specified by these three, is sandwiched between these three dashes. So everything in between is gonna be the YAML options or fields. Um, the indentation again is really important. So uh, you can have things like your title, subtitle, author, um, your format types. What I found is um, if you're using multiple formats um, and you don't have any like specific options that are relative to HTML or docx that you have to include default or errors. And then this is where you set your params. So it's uh, again, a key value pairs. So the params is like the high level key value and then the 
values or fave breed. And then we'd also have pet type. And then um, again, the string of whatever your default parameter is that when you click the render button, um, this is the value that it's going to insert anytime it, see, it says params dollar sign. <clears throat> and then below those three dashes is going to be all of your report code. Uh, and then it's also important to note that your default params or your key value pairs, they have to be in your data set. Either your report will error if your code says, hey, I can't find this, or um, it'll be blank. So like if you were to render a, a fave breed that's not in the data set, that second plot would just be blank. Okay, now how to access your parameters. So you first have to run just any line or chunk in your QMD file to add that params object to your environment. And then once you have run some line or chunk and you have that params in your environment, um, you can access it as a list. So the params object is a list. And then you can use the list notation with the dollar sign to get the uh, value of that default parameter. So if we did params dollar sign fave breed, we would get snowshoe. We can also use inline code in the YAML or in the report content by enclosing your expression with backtick or your expression backtick. And so, for example, if I had in markdown in the in the content of my report, my favorite cat breed is our params dollar sign fave breed, and the asterisks, the double asterisks, just mean bold. It would be rendered like this: my favorite cat breed is the bold snowshoe. So then to replace your, so the second step after uh, setting the values in your YAML is to actually go through your report content and replace those hard-coded values with the params dollar sign, whatever variable you're trying to use. So um, I use inline R code, like you just saw to replace the markdown values. So for example, the, the title where I had my favorite breed, snowshoe, whatever. Um, I use control F to find and replace these values in the code. And for like plot and table titles and labels, I will use the paste function. So I'll demo this so you can have a visual of what I'm talking about. Um, let me put my little instructions on the side. Um, just a second. Okay, so to add the parameters, first we'll add our, um, let's see, and it can be anywhere as long as you've got the indentation correct. So I'm just going to add it at the bottom. So params, and we're going to do pet type, colon, and we can do dogs this time, and then fave breed. Uh, Australian Shepherd. And then if we render that, it won't change anything because we haven't actually used these parameters yet. So it still says snowshoe and it still says breeds of cats, like nothing has changed yet. So just because we've set the default, um, thanks, live coding, right? <laughs> Um, yes. Okay. So I'll then do control F and look for anywhere I've referenced cats. So here I'll replace cats with R parents, dollar sign, pet type. And then let's look for the next one. Um, again, we'll delete that and then copy params pet type. And the next one, so here's where I'd use paste. So since this is in a ggplot uh, subtitle, I'll do paste, which defaults to the spaces as a separator. And this is, of course, where live coding gets really hard of making sure all the parentheses are good and all that. So um, paste, number of registered and living, change that to params, dollar sign, pet, type 
and then gotta close my quotation marks and I think that looks good and any more cats Oop, another I gotta delete the cats and this is my specifics about my three snowshoes so I'll get rid of that so now I'll look for snowshoe with the control F and then again replace with R params dollar sign fave breed and then copy and paste that so instead of filtering to breed equals this hard code card hard coded value of snowshoe params dollar sign fave breed and if there's anything else yes i missed this so snowshoe we should change to fave breed fave breed and Again, another paste, zero paste, regular, grams, dollar sign, fave breed. And notice it does do the auto completion, which is quite nice. And delete snowshoe and add a closing parenthesis. And I think that's all. Okay, so then let's render it and see if it works okay so now oh i forgot the title so in the title you also can have inline code so instead of in cats we'll have our params what did i call it pet type close tick and then re-render okay so now in our report we have registered dogs in switzerland breeds of dogs and the funny thing is the author is my three cats and we can see that our plot is updated and I did not correctly close the date, the paste uh, parenthesis because I have that random 80 there. So just a second. Gotta love live coding. Because this uh, string wrap is so that it wraps the subtitle because the subtitle is very long. So, what did I do wrong now? Okay. There we go. Okay, so now we have our, oh, by the way, I had to look up what this is. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's basically a crossbreed, so a mutt, a mutt. Um, and I don't know what some of these other like Swiss names are. I'm assuming that's like a Chihuahua, but anyways, side note. And then my favorite breed, Australian Shepherd. It's been replaced with our new default parameter. And that's the quick demo. And let's go back to our slides. Oh, they're on the other screen, sorry. Okay, so this is going to be the starting point for our next exercise. So example two, Swiss pets is what you'll open next, but there's a little bit of a few slides uh, to get to that point. So we'll talk about rendering reports now where we are. Uh, let me readjust my screens. Okay, so rendering reports. There are many ways to render your report. First is the render button in our studio. I'm a big shortcut fan, so uh, Control Shift K will also render. You can also check the little render on save box and uh, Control S to save, and then it will automatically re render and preview every single time. Um, then there's also the Cordo command line interface where if you prefer working in the terminal, um, you can pass parameters with this dash P and then put in your key value pairs. But I don't typically use the terminal because I find it kind of scary. <laughs> So instead, I like to use the Cordo pa R package that's a wrapper of the command line interface. And this can be run in your console or your R script. And it has many different arguments, but the most important ones here 
are the input Cordo file name. So what we'll use is the example two, Cordo render, QMT. I use the here package so that we're, uh, Cordo can be, Cordo will default to um, executing in like the root project directory. And so I just, anytime I'm working, anytime, anytime I'm working with Cordo, I default to always using the here package, whether that's um, input scripts, uh, data files, um, R scripts, whatever. I just default to using the here. So then uh, <laughs> the command line loves you. <laughs> um, so then the execute parameters is another argument where you can pass in a named list of your parameters. Um, so here, like I would pass in cats and snowshoe. Um, Maxine, the you don't need to do the backticks are params that's only for inline code so the um yeah so if you're using like markdown um let me go back here so if if you're in markdown mode like just regular text you would use the backtick r inline code syntax but then for when you're actually doing the um code it's just params dollar sign pet type and if you ever get stuck in any exercises, I should have mentioned this before, uh, there's solutions here also, um, besides the first example, um, but you can like look ahead if you if you need help. So, um, okay, this is exercise two. Now we'll open that example to Corda render file and just render it um you can use the render button or control shortcut uh control shift k um take a look at the unique pet breeds that you can pick from because you're going to pick your favorite pet type and breed and change the default parameters in the yaml and re-render it so try using it with just the render button first and then use the Cordo render function. And if you have the slides, um, you can copy and paste this stuff too. So if you, um, cause this is a Cordo presentation, um, if you open up the link to the slides, you can click the little copy to clipboard button and then you don't have to type this all out. Oh, sorry, I put that in a direct message. Let me change it to everyone in meeting. Um, that's not what I meant to send. I meant to send the link to the slides. Okay, so go for it and uh, change the these three underscores to whatever your favorite pet type and pet breed are. And when you're done, let us know what your favorite breed is and if you have any pets. And I'm not being exclusive to hamsters or snakes or fish or whatever you might have. Oh, thanks, Luke. Yeah, I spent so many late nights working on learning how to do this for that skills test. <sighs> it was a lot. And thank you, Livy, for thinking that I'm good at teaching because this is my first time. <laughs> Collies are so cute and corgis and Australian shepherds. Oh my gosh, I just, I love all furry and non-furry pets. They just bring me a lot of happiness because they're all individual and have their own little, their own little personalities and quirks. Oh, thanks for saying I'm a natural teacher. My husband, I think he's probably off the call because he had to go to class. He's a teacher. Uh, he's actually an instructional coach. So like, he'll hate if I say this, but teacher of teachers. Um, so I definitely picked his brain before giving this workshop too. German Shepherds might have a different name. So I don't know what it would be in this list. Cause again, this is a Switzerland data set. <sighs> yes. Uh, sharing my experience. I'm glad it inspired you. <laughs> Because I definitely felt like I was making a mistake and that I didn't actually know what I was doing. But 
somehow made it through. But again, it's all because of the R Stats community and having like really good workshops and blog posts and resources to follow along. Yes, imposter syndrome is so real. I still feel like I'm not actually a data scientist because I don't do any modeling. <laughs> Also, I have no, like, I just kind of arbitrarily picked times of, like, what I thought um, people might need. So hopefully the timing is okay. Um, if you're done, like, super early, it would be a good opportunity to take a break or ask questions or just hang out and chat. Thanks, Millie. Yeah, yeah. Um, I often see like data science equivalent to machine learning and AI and I like don't do that stuff. So it often gets me a little disheartened. Yes, um, I see that Libby, thank you. If you do need to copy, if you did copy and paste this, I am missing a parentheses here. Is right, this, here's one set. Yeah, I'm missing a parenthesis. Parenthi? I don't know. <laughs> Hair on fire emoji. Yep. Andre, um, the difference between RMD and QMD files. So the RMD are R markdown files, and I don't think I have any R markdown files in the POSIT cloud, uh, but the QMD files are Cordo. Where would you put number four at the top under params? I'm sorry, I don't understand that question. Oh, um. Oh, so this number four, um, so this step, you would run this in your console or in R script. This part would not go in the prim. So I'm having this exercise is to sort of test out um, using the YAML default parameters and as one way to render, and then using the Cordo, Cordo render function as another way to render. Um, let's see. Let's look at the posit cloud. Um, let's see. Pets distinct. Are you in the R script or the QMD file? For those who are getting this error. Because I think that's in the R script. Okay. Oh, so okay. I don't. I think I understand the issue. Um. The. The code that I had on that slide. Um. These two things should be run in the console. Sorry, I probably could have done a better job of explaining that. So this is just to get an idea of what the data looks like. So if I run this in the console, uh, first I actually have to attach the packages and then load the data. So now that I have the data loaded in my environment, I have params and pets. And then if I run this pets dplyr, get the distinct um pet types and breeds and then view it now i can scroll through and see the breeds uh is the benefit benefit of doing qmd versus rmd about this pram logic 
Yes and no. Um, so earlier, there's a few slides that are kind of discussing the differences between parameters um, with R Markdown and Cordo. And the main difference is R Markdown um, for the for the output of your reports, like Cordo has the option to do all kinds of um, outputs instead of, and it uses the command line interface instead of using all these different R packages. So um, you can do parameterized reporting with R Markdown or Cordo, but if you want to kind of go to the next generation, um, using Cordo is going to be more fluid and require a lot less dependencies. <laughs> Thanks, Luke, for finding the translation for German Shepherd. Okay, so that was seven minutes. And yes, you do need to put the defaults for the parameters. So uh, where did that chat go? Ahmad, I'm reading through your comment now. OK, so that looks like it worked for you, or no? Are you, Ahmad, did you have an error after running that? Okay, so I'll walk through these steps. Um, okay, so we'll skip just the rendering portion. So, okay, good, you got it. So um, we will also skip the unique breeds because I didn't, clarify that that should have been in the console, but we could have seen our, our pets data frame where we have our pet type, the date, the year, the month, the breed, and how many um, in that population. And then, um, let's see, let's change the default parameters. So I'm gonna pick a ragdoll because that's kind of similar to snowshoe, except much fluffier. So let's go cats and then fave breed, ragdoll, and then render it. And now we have our ragdoll section with our population. So then we will do the render code. So let me copy that so that I don't make mistakes typing in our console. So all we have to change is the underscores um, that are sort of the fill in the blanks. So we'll do cats and then ragdoll and then run that. And then of course I had forgotten the parentheses at the end. So one more parenthesis. And now it's doing the same thing and it will give you the same report question mark for why it was weird. I don't know why the HTML formatting did not come through in the RStudio viewer pane, but that's live coding. So uh, it still has a ragdoll, but basically it, it does the same thing. Um, if it didn't pop up in your viewer pane, um, it might have opened in a different window, and sometimes it doesn't even open at all. I don't know why, um, but your HTML file will be in your files pane, so you can also open it with the view in web browser. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know why. Um, if you need to change, like if you want it to show up in a browser versus the viewer pane, you can go to global options and then 
um, our markdown and show output preview and viewer pane versus window. Okay. So now, uh, say we wanted to render all of these reports for every for a HTML report for every cat breed and every dog breed. That would be 104 cat breeds, 434 dog breeds, so that would be 538 reports total. So the first way to do this manually is to change the default params in the YAML and then either hit the render button or use the keyboard shortcut, which will render the file with the same name as the QMD file. So for example, it would be, what is this called? Uh, example two, Cordo render HTML. So then I'd have to go through and rename that to be ragdoll so that they're all different names. And then repeat this for 537 times. Um, there is an output file YAML option, um, but it does not seem to work with um, inline R code. And it just, yeah, so you would have to manually rename the file to add that parameter so that you have your individual reports. So you can have your 538 reports called dogs breed.html. Then the second way is to use the Cordo render function where you can choose your output file name and put your parameters as your named list, but then you would need to have 538 of these for every single report. So you probably could write a script that um, writes these lines for you, but why not programmatically render all of your reports. So we'll use Cordo render, which is again from the Cordo R package that calls the command line interface. And this argument, the, it takes uh, three arguments for parameterized reports. So the first one will be your output format, which is gonna be your file type. So whether that's HTML, reveal.js, PDF, whatever. Then your output file, which is gonna be your file name that includes the extension. So like snowshoe.html. And then execute params is your named list of parameters. So once you have this data frame, you can then iterate over each row using the per pwalk function. So you would um, use this with your data frame that we just created up here, and then use the quarter render function, and then pass in each of those arguments. So what that looks like is we have our um, pets data frame. We're going to get the distinct pet breed combos and then use uh, set the output format to HTML. For this case, we're just talking about HTML. And then we're going to make our output file column. So this might look a little complicated, but I'm just making it so that the file names are pretty. So it's all lowercase. We have our pet type, so like cats. And then um, we're gonna replace the spaces with a uh, dash and then insert the breed and then add report and the separator will be a dash. So it just, you'll see in the next slide that it has pretty file names. Then we'll use, set the third column as the named list that is the execute underscore params column. And this is another per function called map two where we're iterating over two different variables so that we're having the combination of each pet breed with the breed. So this uses an anonymous function and we're creating a named list. So I see some chat about posit about per and posit academy and it's yeah per is a little scary. Uh, actually a lot scary. It took me a while to get it and the way that I learned it was Googling things and Stack Overflow and Posit Community and basically copying people's code and then just tweaking it till it worked. So that's what all of these workshop materials are here for you for so that you all have this code and you can just copy paste and tweak and hopefully it works. So 
um, again, we're creating three columns that have the distinct combination of our pet type and breed that has the output format, the output file, and execute parameters. And so this is what that looks like. So I'm just subsetting to the first two cat and dog breeds so that we can just have a sneak peek of um, what this looks like. So again, it's all lowercase, separated by dashes, all HTML. Our execute params, um, since this is printed as a cable uh, table, um, it doesn't show like the structure, but it um, the actual data frame is a named list. So it would be pet type equals cats fave breed equals Abyssinian. So um, we're just gonna work with the first two cat and dog breeds so that it doesn't take too long to render everything. So then we can use the per pwalk function to iterate over uh, the entire um, row of our data frame. The pwalk in general just iterates over multiple arguments simultaneously. So like in parallel, um, Again, this is like a little complex, but hopefully you can get the basics um, enough to where you can just modify this code. So the dot L argument is the first argument and it's going to be a list of vectors, but um, the data frame is a very special case of this argument that will iterate over the entire row of the data frame. So um, what that looks like is, and you don't need to have the dot L, I'm just doing this for clarity. Um, like you can just have it, you know, in the right uh, position order. So our pet report subset is our data frame that we're gonna map over. Then the function that we're applying to each row is the Cordo render function. And then the input is, um, so this is the argument that we have to explicitly state because it's not in our data frame. So this is telling us, it's telling the function what input file is our template. Um, and notice that we don't have the output file or format or um, I forgot the third column. Uh, oh, execute params in here because it uh, gets passed automatically and we have the same exact column names. So, and then the dot progress equals true actually just adds a cute little progress bar. And so when you're rendering lots and lots of reports at the at the same time, um, you can have a progress bar to kind of show you like an ETA, which is nice. And yes, uh, tidyverse can be slower, but I, uh, it works for my brain. <laughs> so limitations. Um, Cordo can't render reports to another directory um, unless it's a project like a book or a website. So there is this output dir YAML option, um, but that is specifically for books and websites that are like technically defined as Cordo projects. And Cordo projects have this underscore Cordo.yaml file that makes it a Cordo project. So in your regular like reporting data anal uh, data analysis workflows, this won't work. So the workaround is to then use, um, you, you can use base R like dir.move or files move, whatever those functions are, or you can use the FS package, um, which is I think part of the tidyverse to move the files after the rendering. So we'll see an example of this in the next exercise. But this is what I do so that I first render all of the reports into just the project folder where the QMD files live and then move them into a report subdirectory. Um, there's more info in a GitHub discussion and GitHub issue for um, sort of the background or if you're interested in the nitty gritty of why this works the way it does. Because again, it's not our, it's not native to R. Um, and it is using a command line interface, so there are limitations um, compared to our markdown. So then the other thing that I've had to find a workaround to, not even a workaround actually, is a lesson that I've learned the hard way, um, is if you use this embed resources true, which basically makes the document standalone. So for example, um, your HTML reports that have JavaScript in them, CSS styling, um, and other sorts of 
resources. Um, if you don't have this embed resources true, it's going to have this underscores files folder that has all of those external resources. Um, so if you in your YAML set embed resources to true, that all gets bundled into that HTML file. Um, but the problem is, is if you have your Cordo file in a subfolder or subdirectory, you'll get this error that says warning could not fetch resource. And I don't know all the computer science stuff for why that is. Um, so there's more information in this discussion GitHub issue. So what I've learned is to just make sure that all of my QMD files are at the very top level of my project. Um, and I actually learned this while putting together this workshop because I originally had an exercises folder and then I was getting errors. So um, lessons learned. Okay, so another demo where we will walk through how to render all of the reports at once. So I'm going to go to this example three render reports. Let me zoom in just a smidge if I can. Oh gosh. Whoa, I meant to zoom in just a little bit and I don't know what happened. How do I get out of this? <laughs> Does anybody know how to get out of this like crazy zoom? Oh boy. Uh, okay. <laughs> My bad. I just meant to zoom in a little bit. Um, okay, I'm just going to make the font a little bigger. Um, appearance. Okay. So uh, render reports. So first we will attach all of our packages, uh, load up our data frame. And so then this is the creating the data frame that we're going to iterate over. So this is the same code that's in the slide. Again, we're getting every combination of cat or dog breed. And then we're going to add a column for the HTML output. We're going to create our file name, um, again, with the lowercase and dashes. And then we're going to run this map to um, per function to get our named list of pet types, and fave breeds. So what that looks like is uh, pet reports. So we have pet type, cats and dogs, breed. And again, um, we had to add this column specifically so that we have something to filter by and therefore have a parameter. Um, so the pet type wasn't initially part of the data that I had exported, I had to add that in that data R script. Um, so then, yeah, pre, uh, breed, output format, output file, and then this is what the execute params looks like. So it's a list, a named list, and if we open up one, we can see pet type is cats, fave breed is Abyssinian. Um, then we will subset to the first two of each so if we look at our pet report subset, um, and I also just selected the files that we would need, or the columns that we would need. So output file, output format, execute params. And then we can run this pwalk. And this is so fun because it has the progress bar. So you can see it will take 11 seconds to render all three of these reports. And it's doing it all at one time. And it's like magic. Okay, so now we can see we have cats, Obsidian report, cats, Sajian report, dog, Afghan pincher, and dogs, Afghan hound reports. And this is where I want to move these rendered reports. So um, I'm going to set my output dir to uh, reports because I want my folder to be named reports. I'm going to list all of the files that have that end in HTML. So if we look at our files, we can see that this includes all of the HTML reports. And then um, if 
So the dirk create function from fs will create the directory if it's not in existence already, but it, it won't overwrite the directory if it already exists. So now we have this reports directory that's empty, and then we can move the files. And like magic, we have our reports out of our project folder and into this reports folder. So this is the next exercise. Um, let me jump back over here. Uh, hold on, a couple more slides and then the exercise. Multiple formats. So um, you can add to the format YAML option or field to add additional output formats. So the options are like PDF, docx, uh, reveal JS if you wanted. Um, and then uh, you'll see that once you save that new document that has these additional format options, there's now a little arrow next to the render button where you can pick whether you want to render to HTML, PDF, or um, Word based on what formats you've selected in your YAML. And so there's more documents, uh, documentation on multiple formats. And what's cool with Quarto and um, these different format options in the YAML is that if you're rendering to HTML, it will automatically give you a little like table of contents or underneath the table of contents, um, this other formats like menu where you can click on PDF or MS Word and it will actually download this other format, which is super cool, I think. Um, so you can choose which format links you want to include. So like, say you only want to include a PDF. Um, this could be other resources too. Like if you wanted to include the raw data or an Excel spreadsheet or whatever, like you can um, specify these different links. Uh, you can also choose to hide all the links, which is what I've done in these examples. So you'll see that I have format links is false. Okay, now for the exercise, this is the one that has the longest time. Um, what you're going to do is modify the YAML to add a new format. Um, you can add PDF, docx, reveal.js, whatever you want, and then render, or sorry, modify the script to add this new format to the data frame used in PWOC. Modify the uh, red jext argument in the ls function to also include HTML, docx, or PDF. Um, in this argument, you can use the like regular or notation, which is the pipe, um, so that you can render to multiple options at the same time. And then when you're done, uh, put whether any of these functions, or sure, which, which if any of these functions um, from the Cordo files we've worked on or the R file that are new to you. So I'm going to start the timer, and this one might be a little bit more challenging, so let me know if in the chat if it's confusing, and I can just start walking through it too, but I'll give you some time to, to try it yourself first. I'm loving all the excitement in the chat. Makes me so happy.
I'm so glad you guys are getting uh, getting something out of this. Yay, Ahmad, I'm super glad to hear that. Um, so the pipe is not going to go in the YAML. The pipe is gonna go in the um R script. So let me switch over here. So um, in exercise three, the pipe is going to go, you're going to modify this line right here, the files, stir list. So what you want to do is change this argument so that it also can um, get the file names of your docx or PDF or whatever. So let me close some of these guys. So you're going to modify the YAML of the Corto or render reports QMD file. So this area right here, um, you're going to add another format of your choosing. And then you're going to modify the PWOC um, function argument so that way, or sorry, let me try this one. Oh, so you're going to, um, change this data frame so that way you have a HTML and whatever other format you want. And I am realizing that it's already five o'clock and I only have a half an hour left. So I'm going to ignore the four minutes and just start going through this exercise. So my apologies if you did not get through all the way. So um, first off, let's see, modify the YAML of render reports to add a new format. So let's just add PDF and Word doc. So format, um, again, it is five o'clock in Tacoma, Washington right now, 5 p.m. Um, okay, so I have the little rainbow parentheses so I can see that I'm in the same line. Um, so I'm gonna add PDF and defaults and then docx defaults, um, then Let's see what else I'm supposed to do for this exercise. Um, modify the render reports.r to include the file extension. So that is here. So we'll use the or operator and then dot x dollar sign means that it's the end of the file and dot pdf dollar sign. And then the last thing is to um, oh, yeah, go back and add the file extension. So I am going to cheat a little bit and um, go to my solution because my brain is getting tired. So I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let's see, where am I? What am I doing? Oh, the PWOC function. Okay, so let me open my solution for the doc R. And what I actually did was 
I created, so I used the same like HTML reports that's there, but then what I did was I copied um, this data frame from HTML to PDF, and then I mutated and replaced any time I had uh, HTML with actually docx. That's kind of embarrassing. I think I was playing around with the exercises. So, okay. So now let me restart R and then walk through all of these again, just so that we're on a clean slate, loading the data, making our HTML data frame, make our docx data frame, and now we're going to bind these two together using the rbind function. And now we have pet reports for every single cat breed and every single dog breed, but we have output format is HTML and docx. So um, we can now subset and then map over each of these rows um again the subset only so that should run and now we'll have html and word documents in about 30 seconds The little things make me so happy. This little progress bar. I love it. Okay, so um, now that we have all of our reports rendered that we can see in our file pane here. And then uh, we'll move our reports. So output directory, all of our files, whether it ends in HTML, docx, or PDF, and then create our reports directory and move the files. So you can see in the files pane, all of those reports got moved and we have our Word documents and our, so the, um, because we're in Posit Cloud, um, the name is weird. So that's not uh, what it would actually be called if you're working in your R Studio. At least I think. So you can see our Word file and our HTML file, which is super cool. So um, yes, when you move them, I believe it does write over the previous ones. So if I were to, um, let's see, let me test that by deleting this title and just putting Switzerland. And then doing this again, let me just source it and see what happens. I love questions that I don't know the answer to that I can actually just like test and see, because I don't know. I'm pretty sure it rewrites, but I could be wrong. Okay, so yes, so now you can see the modified. It's all 505 now. Okay, so that's that exercise. And now let's do conditional content. So this is basically if you have like, you're rendering to HTML and PDF and you only wanna have like interactive things for your um, HTML files, but um, static, like just regular ggplot, um, or no tab sets for, or any like HTML widgets for your um, PDFs or Word documents. So um, there's three, there's, there's two ways to control content visibility. There's these two different classes, um, dot content visible and dot content hidden. And there's three things that you can apply these to. So the first is divs. So if you've never seen a div before, it's this little dot uh, colon, colon, colon. And you can have um, as many colons as you want, um, but minimum of three. So sometimes you can add more colons if you've got multiple divs and have them nested. Um, so 
sometimes you'll see the curly braces here and sometimes you won't and I don't have the answer for why that is um so my go-to is just looking at documentation and seeing the examples so for content visible it does need the little curly braces so the second uh, attribute, so this this content visible is a class, and then the attribute comes after the class, and the attribute is the when format, which is special to Cordo. Um, this whole like visibility class is special to Cordo, for, to my knowledge. Um, and then if you set it to HTML or whatever, um, this content will only be visible if the format is HTML. And you can also set it to um, non-executable code. So when I say non-executable code, um, it's still going to be executed. Like it will still uh, run the code, but it will only be visible to um, HTML, like when you have the when format specified. And then you can also apply it to spans. And spans are the square brackets. So you have some text and then you have the curly braces and um, the content visible. And I think I answered my question of the class um, or the, when the curly braces are used is if it's a class. So classes are denoted by the period before the class name. So I actually am pretty sure that that is when you need the little curly braces is if it's specifically a class. And that's all CSS stuff. So um, then, th uh, so this this pairs really well with the include short codes, where you can reuse content without copying and pasting. So what an include short code does is it embeds essentially or includes um, whatever content you have in another Cordo file. So. For example, and, and best practice is to use this underscore prefix so that they're ignored by a Cordo project. So um, they're not considered like standalone documents. So if I had a, a QMD file that had like information specific to cats and specific to dogs um, that say was like 500 lines long of text or code or whatever, um, I can use this include short code so that my main Cordo document doesn't have the like 600 lines of code or whatever. So it really shortens um, your main document and avoids the need for copying and pasting. So I, if you look at the source code for the workshop materials, this is what I did for the slides. So I have my index slide and it uses the uh, short code. So each like chapter of this um, presentation uh, is like 200 lines per QMD file. But if I hadn't used short codes, it would be like over 1200 lines long and harder to navigate. So um, this is really useful if you want to include like tab sets um, where you have um, for if you want to include tab sets for interactive files. So um, if you also include this panel tab set div, so this one does not have curly braces and does not have the period sign because it's not a class, it's like a feature of Cordo. Um, you can include a tab set where uh, the, the two hashtags, pound signs, whatever, um, is a level two heading and that denotes a different tab. So we'll see an example of this when we do our next exercise. But um, this is really cool. So that way, this is actually a typo. So the static one should be docx. Um, or no, no, that's not a typo. Sorry, unless the format is HTML. So the content is visible unless the format's HTML. You could have, I could have also said content hidden when format is HTML. So there's multiple ways to use these content visible, content hidden um, class types. Okay, so again, there's these four different options. You can do content visible when format is, content visible unless format is, content hidden unless format is, or content hidden unless format yeah, so it, there's, I tend to just use content visible when and unless, um, it, yeah. 
So the, the exercise here is to modify um, example four so that the panel tab set is only used for HTML documents by filling in the content class. Um, and I am just going to walk through it because I want to make sure we get through all these slides and exercises. So um, let me clean things up. Ooh, shoot. I just exited the posit cloud instance. Okay, so exercise four, conditional content. Um, okay, so um, notice that I have the underscore example for report content. This is just the content. So I'm not actually running this because it's going to get run in the actual conditional content example. Um, and I have that underscore prefix to make it more clear that this isn't to be run by itself. So um, what we're going to do is modify so that the panel tab set is only used for HTML by filling in the content blank class. So um, static content. OK, so will be content hidden when format equals HTML, and then content visible when format equals HTML. And then we will try to render. It. Oh, um, let me actually render this first without those edits um, so that you can see what it looks like. I don't know if this will run because, OK. OK, so this is what it looks like without those content hidden visible. So we have two copies of both plots, one where it's uh, like laid out regularly, and then one that has these HTML tab sets. So now, if I run the solution where I have these content visible unless and when format is, um, and we hit render, now we've hidden the um, static like just list and only have the tab set for the uh our, the html and then if we render it to a pdf now we only have the static where it's listed out instead of having the tab sets so that is conditional content with using these content visible classes um, yes, Ahmad, um, this is similar to knitting a child in our markdown. And yes, Nicole, the um, pet type breed, uh, that's anonymous functions with per, and it does work similar to .x and .y. Um, you'd have to look at the per documentation for a little bit more explanation than that, though, because I don't I'm not up for describing it right now. Like my brain is getting super tired as we get to the end of this workshop. So um, conditional code execution. So it's more efficient to not execute code that generates interactive outputs for static reports. Um, because like, again, if you had used the conditional content, um, it would still run that code. It just would hide the output from it um, in the, uh, version that you're hiding that content, like it's still running. So then um, instead, we are going to use R and Arc Markdown and Knitter to be able to control whether or not we're executing code based on the output format. So if we wanted to have ggplot code for our PDF and Word documents, um, we would set it to execute only for 
PDF and Word doc. But then if we wanted to have interactive um, like Plotly code or, or ggiraffe for HTML reports, then we could use this uh, conditional code execution. Um, so I think this was a feature of our markdown, but it's not a feature of Cordo yet. Um, there is a GitHub discussion where uh, Cordo dev thinks that um, this might be a feature coming in version 1.4, but this comment was from January of 2023 and Cordo 1.4 is coming out soon. And I don't think that there's been any activity on this. So um, for now, the workaround is to use the knitter function um, to basically get the output that the markdown is sending to Pandoc. Um, so you would include this uh, this specific line in your setup chunk of your Cordo file to get the format. Um, so this format variable would be set to like PDF or sorry, LaTeX for PDF or HTML. Um, let's see. So then to so once you have this format variable, you can then use it in the eval expression. So this is a chunk option. This is the um, new Cordo like way of including chunk options that I mentioned before. Um, it's the pound sign and the pipe um, and then eval colon. So this is a special like, um, I don't know what you would call it, but the dollar sign expr um, is a special syntax where it will evaluate this R code. So then you can do if the format is static, so if the format is either LaTeX or DOCX, then run this code. Alternatively, you could set the expression format equals HTML and then have your Plotly code. So the um, this what you call it doesn't matter. It's the fact that you're getting the output option and then using that in your expression in the uh, evaluation, that is what is controlling that. Um, you can even use your parameters. So uh, maybe you have a code chunk, like um, I had that little bit about my favorite capping a snowshoe because I have these kitties, um, my three rescues. Uh, and I wanna talk about it only if I'm writing a report where the favorite breed is snowshoe. So then I could include this expression, prams dollar sign fav breed is snowshoe. And more about this in the Cordo documentation. And then this is the last exercise where we're gonna modify the conditional code um, examples so that we're only executing the code chunks for ggplot, for PDF or MS Word, and we're only executing the Plotly code for HTML documents. So we're going to go through this together again. So, files, example, conditional code. Okay, so um, again, we've got our format set to HTML, PDF, docx, and we're going to modify this. Um, I don't know how people do workshops that are more than two hours long. And at the end of the day, like my brain is kind of fried. So I'm gonna just go to the solution and talk through the solution. So, we're going to run this chunk to attach our packages, load our data. And so this is what we added to the, the setup chunk is we're getting this format. Um, and when we run that, let me actually clear out my environment so that it is clean. So when we run this first setup chunk, we have our params object that looks like this. That is our default parameters. We have our pets data frame and we have this format, which is null because we aren't, because we have three defaults right now, HTML, PDF and docx, and it doesn't know what format we're using. Um, but I think if we were to delete these two and then rerun that, we'd get HTML. I don't know. It might be a posit cloud thing too. Um, Cause I think normally in my art studio, it would say HTML, but I could be wrong on that. Um, but then let's see if we render this. 
So um, what I did in this solution is add it. So um, I have a plot chunk that creates the plot called breeds top five plot. And then I have two chunks where I have um, one where I'm just calling that ggplot func uh, object if the format is LaTeX or DocX. And if another chunk option that runs Plotly if the format is HTML. So um, let me render the one without the solution so you can see. Uh, we'll have copies of both. So we've got Plotly and um, the static ggplot for both. So that's what the like exercise looks like. And then the solution for an HTML document will not have two copies because we've set the eval expression to only execute the plotly code if the format is HTML. And now we can see that the plotly is the only charts that are in this report. And then if we were to render it to a PDF, we will only see the PDF. And I think I need to open that separately. Render PDF. Um, I don't know what's happening. Oh, because I got rid of the format params. Okay, PDF default. That would be why I think. Render PDF. Okay, so here we go. Um, now we have a PDF that only has the ggplot code and it does not have the plotly code. So it works by, again, using uh, creating a new chunk for just the plotly code and then um, the expression format, um, depending on whether the format is evaluated to LaTeX, DocX, or HTML. And we'll finish up with a quick summary from our learning objectives. So the first one was understanding what parameterized reporting is when it's useful. So I like to think of them like very fancy custom functions where you have your function as your your QMD template as your function, the parameters are your input, and the rendered reports are your output. They're useful for creating variations of the same report, um, like country, like any sort of spatial groupings, any time periods, breeds, species, diseases, trials, whatever. Um, we only covered reports in this workshop, but you can also parameterize reveal JS presentations. And there's this Jumping Rivers blog post that has kind of a tutorial on uh, generating slides for these different variations. Um, the second was to convert a report into a parameterized template where we're including the default params in the YAMLs, the first step, and then the second step, we're recoding, or sorry, we're replacing all of the hard coded values in the params uh, with params, dollar sign, whatever your variable is. And what that looks like is, again, the params key value pairs with uh, as many params as you want that are strings, booleans, or numbers, uh, using your params as your inline code, or and then uh, including it in your code chunks with the params dollar sign pet type. So hopefully these like summary slides can just be kind of quick refreshers without having to like comb through all the other slides. Um, the third one was rendering all the variations of the report using Cordo and Per, where we're getting all the unique combinations into a data frame that has the same arguments as Cordo render for the column names. Um, using PWALK with Cordo render to actually render them all at one time. And then lastly, generating multiple format outputs with the same template using conditional content and code. So there's the four options of content visible when or unless the format equals something. And these are class types. And then um, in two steps, 
controlling the visibility or the execution of code by first getting the pandoc format output whatever in your setup chunk and then using the eval expression as a chunk option to control whether or not your code is executed. Okay, so that's all I have and it is 527. Oh my goodness. And my brain is dead. Um, this is my first workshop and I'm going to do this again for Our Ladies Abuja, uh, February 21st, I think. So if you could please do this survey, this would be super helpful to me as I make any revisions or improvements. Um, like, for example, there were some, uh, I think I could make the exercises shorter or something because this has been chaotic with um, trying to fit all this into two hours. Um, the website workshop is here. And then I would love to just stay connected. And I'm sorry I didn't leave any questions or any time for questions or even give you all a chance to like go through all the exercises yourselves. But man, kudos to people who do this all the time. I'm exhausted. Thank you so much, Peggy. That was <laughs> such a rich workshop and I'm sure everybody learned so much. I certainly did so comprehensive and so much material and i'm sure we'll all be watching <laughs> the recording soon again so thank you so much and i can see that so much work has gone into creating all of this material and preparing for this so thank you thank you thank you thank you all i'm so excited that there are so many of you attending live yeah and you know usually we see we see the list of participants kind of like taper down and people drop off, but that did not happen. So kudos nice. to you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's a question about when you're doing this again. I think you mentioned. Um, I think it's February 21st um, for Our Ladies Abuja. For the, it's the capital of Nigeria, I believe, which is really cool. So it's like in the morning so that it's not a super unreasonable time for them. Fantastic. Um, and um, yeah, we have the recording and I'll be uh, posting it soon. I think on the meetup site, I'll have to check. Cool. We'll, we'll tweet and post on LinkedIn about it. And this website, the workshop website will live for however long and I'll add the recording down here also and if you want to download the exercises you can use this function um the cloud I think we can submit uh like another request to just keep this one up and just move it to the other Our Ladies chapter uh I don't know exactly how that works but I did read that they like usually shut it down after a couple weeks so hopefully this one stays up since I'm doing the workshop again yeah, we can touch base separately about that. All right. Thanks, everyone. With that, we'll end the uh, Zoom meeting. Thank you. Have Thank you, everybody.